So I'm here with Mike, founder and CEO of ButcherBox, which you guys have seen a lot of on my channel. So we're going to talk some really cool stuff. We're going to talk about how to read a meat label properly. We're going to talk about the sourcing, everything like that. It's just going to blow your mind how the business side of meat works and why ButcherBox is what it is today. So Mike, awesome to have you here, man. Yeah, super excited to be here. Thanks so much. And, Big and fan of what you do. <laughs> Big fan of what you guys do too. Is it's uh, I mean personally, you've changed the game for me. You've changed so that I'm not uh, scouring the grocery store constantly trying to find every little piece on a label that I need to look for when it comes to meat. So thank you, you guys too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, we'll jump right in. I mean, my audience is always very, very interested in sort of the nitty gritty and what they really need to be looking for on a label. And a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to the nutrition facts side on my channel most of the time and talking about, yes, you know, these are the macros you need to be paying attention to and things like that. But I mean, how does someone properly read a meat label when it comes down to uh, some of the guidelines and some of the things that people don't really know about? You know, you see, you look at a, a package of meat and you see like seven different little colorful buttons. You know, there's non-GMO project verified, there's this and that. What Coming from someone that's in the industry, how does that how does that work? How do you navigate it? Yeah. Um, so I think uh, as, as a starting point, it's it's important to for your audience to know that what's happened over the past 10 years as um, the world of what we call claims based meat, but um, meat that has additional claims in addition to it just being meat, that world has grown. And um, the way that grocery stores have uh, re uh, responded to that is to do what, what, what I call the greenwashing of the meat case. So like you said, I mean, now you go in and you see like a leaf and you see the words natural and you see all this stuff on there that, you know, frankly, doesn't really mean much. Um, and so it's confusing to understand uh, what what means what. So totally happy to talk about the topic because I think it's very important. Um, so a little bit about us. I mean, we do uh, grass fed, um, so 100 percent grass fed. So um, and then we do antibiotic and hormone free, which is never, ever, meaning that the animal was never given an antibiotic or a hormone. Uh, that's kind of our baseline of, of what we do. So I'll start with grass fed uh, on the beef side. Um, it used to be and this still happens on occasion. Um, just make sure that when you see grass fed, grass fed doesn't necessarily also mean it was grass finished. Uh, every cow starts off as grass fed. And then 98% of the cows end up in a feedlot being fed uh, uh, grains. Um, and so sometimes they'll say grass fed in big letters and then grain finished in small letters, uh, try to throw, throw you off that way. Um, in general, you wanna look for 100% grass fed. Uh, now it's gotten more confusing because in this country, and hopefully we can talk more about um, you know, grass fed and what's happening in this country, but in this country, uh, the way that the industry has responded to grass fed is to um, uh, basically feed cows uh, grass or pellets or even corn stalks in a feedlot and it's considered grass fed. Mm -hmm. um, so what I tell people is, um, you know, if, if your notion of grass fed is a cow just walking around, ambling around and eating grass, you really need to look for pasture raised. Um, grass fed isn't good enough anymore because people are starting to really mess with what that means. Grass fed, 100% grass fed. So if you're really looking for a cow that just like hangs out and eats grass, 100% grass fed is um, where where you should play. Uh, on the antibiotic and hormone side, um, you, you like to look for the words never ever, which meant that it was never fed or never. Sometimes they, people just use never. It was never given an antibiotic or a hormone. Uh, antibiotic free doesn't really mean what you think it does. Um, and so you want to, you know, if you're looking for the utmost of quality, that's, that's another area to focus on. Um, and the, the, the finally, uh, one, one thing that I found, which is kind of a hack is, um, so the way that grocery works is in general, grocery stores buy something and then they double the price and try to sell it to you. Uh, that's essentially how meat, the, the meat case works in the grocery store. Um, with these claims based products, what a lot of grocery stores are doing, this is pre but what a lot of grocery stores do is they're afraid that they'll be able to sell all of it. So they'll actually more than double the price because mm -hmm. if they don't, it, because they're worried about what they call shrink. So that's the stuff they weren't able to sell. And the stuff they do sell has to carry the, the losses of the things that didn't sell. Yeah. Um, and so what happens is you go into a store and you find like a brick of ground beef for $7.99 or, you know, it's, 
in, in a lot of cases, if you want to eat healthy and claims based, it's pretty expensive to do so. Um, one hack is to look in the freezer aisle or the freezer section, because in that case, uh, what grocery stores do is they just freeze it and they're not worried about shrink as much. So you can you tend to be able to find better deals uh, in frozen rather than in fresh. So that's another another thing that I tell people who are not ButcherBox subscribers, but uh, still looking for good quality stuff and shopping for themselves. That's a super good hack. And that's that parallels. It's nice to know that about the meat side of things, because I always preach that when it comes down to veggies, like the yep. frozen section, you, you get, I mean, at least from a, from a health perspective, generally a much less oxidized vegetable. Like you're getting something that is typically flash frozen when you're looking at the vegetables. So I always say, don't, you know, people talked about people perimeter shopping at the grocery store, which I fully appreciate, but there is some serious gold nuggets in the frozen section. And oh. uh, so you'll find me in the frozen section all the time digging up, you know, that's where I'm going to get broccoli. That's where I'm going to get, you know, it just comes down to knowing how to defrost it properly, which probably should do a whole separate video on, because to be completely honest, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> right. I find frozen to be way more convenient. I think, um, I, I, I think frozen is, um, uh, like millennial and, and, uh, before M millennial and younger, let's say in, in many cases, um, you know, food goes to die in your refrigerator, right? So you, you go home with your fresh head of broccoli and then, I mean, again, this is pre times, but it's like, uh, then you're, Hey, you want to go hang out and go out to dinner? And it's like, okay, great. Or you, you work late one day or you do something else. And all of a sudden the head of broccoli that you plan on cooking, yeah. um, it just, it just rots and it's food waste. Uh, frozen that doesn't happen it can last forever um, and so I'm a big believer in frozen as well it is a it is a wise 150 to 200 dollar investment to have a, a deep freeze in your garage I have learned that it's just yeah and especially with you know potential you know there's talk of shortages and things like that when we don't know we don't have a crystal ball to see exactly what's coming I mean I'm I'm not a hoarder by any stretch of imagination but I like to be prepared and I mean I speak for myself when I have a pretty strict diet and I don't like to get thrown off of it. I know how to navigate if I do, but I like to be able to, you know, know that I have what I need on hand. I'm also a creature of habit. I eat a lot of the same thing day in and day out. So, but I digress. Well, so on along the same vein, I was, uh, I have a lot of experience in the, the produce world and supply chain in the produce world, just because I, I grew up in uh, Northern California, lots of, lots of produce, you know, near the central Valley. Like I, I just had lots of friends that were in the agriculture business in that world. So I'm very familiar with supply chain in that, but I was blown away learning a little bit about, um, you know, meat supply chain, how that process works. I mean, it's not just as simple as it going on a truck, going to the store and then you purchase, there's a lot of moving pieces, yeah. uh, in logistically, but also just economically business sense, everything like that. Yep. Yeah, totally. And you're also dealing with a, a live animal at the at the other end, right? So that's true. You know, one of the things, and it, it is similar to produce, but one of the things that I think people take for granted is you you can't just snap your fingers and say like, I need a cow, right? It doesn't work like that. Like those things have to be grown. Um, yeah. Grass fed animals are usually two years or more uh, in terms of age. So um, in our world, you know, one of the things that we're always balancing is how do we grow as a company, but also do so responsibly so that we can make sure that people have, um, you know, farmers know what, what uh, we're already buying into Q1 of next year. So, you know, nine months in advance, we're telling farmers what, what to expect um, because all of this stuff takes time. And what we're doing essentially is convincing people to raise an animal differently than most animals are raised. And that takes time. Um, so, uh, uh, I'll start with, um, I, I guess I'll start with grass fed and then we can, we can talk about any of it. I'm happy to geek out on any piece of the, the supply chain. Cause I, I love the whole thing. And I've, I, I was not a meat person. Um, before this, I ran a, a, a tech company. Uh, we raised a bunch of venture capital. It didn't work out. Um, and this was a hobby. My, my wife and I were looking for grass fed beef because she has a thyroid condition and we couldn't find it. And so I was like, geez why can't we find this? And so I just like started, you know, as I, as I do, I started just getting obsessed with how can I find great quality meat? And, uh, and, and this was a hobby and it turned out to be something a little, a little bit, it, it butcher box wanted to be something bigger than a hobby. Um, and so, uh, so I've like gone to school on this whole, this, the whole supply chain. Um, so in this country, most cows end up, uh, in a feedlot, like I said. So most cows are fed a diet of grains for the last six months, six ish months of their life. 
Uh, every cow starts off the same way. So there's one step which they call cow calf, which is about six months where it's a, a, a cow, a mother cow, and it's calf. Um, and they're just, the calf is drinking milk and hanging out with its mother who's eating grass. And they're just kind of like, you know, living a, living a life of cow and calf. Then, uh, that cow gets sold usually, uh, gets sold to somebody else who takes the cow from six months to around 18 months. So it's about a year long period where a farmer will hold on to that animal and grow it on grass. So it's just eating grass. It's out in the field, just hanging out, munching on grass. Um, depending on where in the country they're raised, sometimes there's not enough grass. So they're fed a supplement of, you know, uh, depending on what it is, but they'll, they'll put out these, what they call bunkers and they'll feed it, um, other stuff. So that like, if you're in a, there's a lot of snow on the ground, they don't have to forage for grass. Um, and then the last step. So now the cow is 18 months old. Uh, the last step, uh, usually is that that, um, cow goes to market and gets sold to a feedlot. Um, and the way that works is, um, usually is farmer brings it to a, uh, like a market area and whatever the, the price is on that given day, that cow is being sold at whatever price it's being sold at. Um, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of super fascinating, like, uh, pressures for that, um, that farmer to sell. So for example, they have generally the farmer takes out a loan from the bank to buy the, buy the calf and hold it for a year. And generally those loans become due. Yeah. Um, and so they're kind of forced to sell regardless of what the market conditions are. Got it. So okay. for example, when it hit one thing that happened was the slaughterhouses, uh, the, the harvest facilities as they're called had to slow down because a lot of them are closing because of huge outbreaks. And so if a harvest facility was um, harvesting, uh, call it a thousand head of cattle a day, all of a sudden they were running at 500 cattle a day. And so what happened was then the feedlots weren't able, they were normally giving this company a thousand head of cattle and now they can only give them 500. So they are stuck with all this cattle. And so then they're not buying from the farmer. Yep. And so the, the, the market price of, uh, of meat just plummeted. Which is really fascinating because it's at the exact same time where you go to the grocery store and there's like no meat on the shelf. Yep. It's actually the farmer on the other end is just getting completely screwed. I mean, the, the story, yeah. which I'm happy to go into, are, you know, devastating in terms of uh, not necessarily on cattle because you can just keep it eating grass. But for pigs and chickens, the, the amount of um, uh, animals that were just euthanized because there was yeah. no there was like no market for them. It's just it's crazy. Uh, well, no, let, let's let's go into that a little bit because, and you know, it's I think from an economics perspective, whatever you feel comfortable speaking to with that. I mean, I don't know if uh, I certainly didn't. And when I started learning about it, the amount of uh, money that was, uh, I mean, when you have a lot of head of cattle and you're stuck with it, um, oh yeah, that's a very dangerous position for these farmers and their families. And it's you. It, it's yeah. And then it comes down to a question of ethics. There's all kinds. So, I mean, yeah, definitely. I mean, when, like, how did it look for, for chickens and for, for pigs? Like, what was this? Yeah. I mean, so similar, similar phenomenon, which is, uh, chicken and pigs, um, uh, generally a farmer who raises uh, like one farmer will raise a chicken all the way through to completion. They usually get a chick chick comes into their hen house and then they raise it up and then, um, then they sell it because the chicken is only, is usually like 45 days old, right? It's like not that long of a life of a lifespan. Yeah. Um, pigs, usually it's like one farmer who raises a pig as well. So in that case, you have these farmers who've been raising, uh, raising a chicken or, or raising a pig for a year and a half or two years. Uh, and then, um, there's no market for it. There's nowhere for that pig to go. There's no way for that pig to be, um, uh, processed and made into meat. Yeah. So imagine a world where you're a farmer and you've been raising this animal for two years or a year and a half day in and day out because they take a ton of work. Um, and then at the very end, when you're supposed to be able to get enough money to pay back your loan, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing there. And that is, that is, that's farming. Um, and the unfortunate part, I mean, especially in the, in the pork industry, uh, the pork industry has just been um, decimated over the past few years. I mean, it's been really, really tough. And the big problem is like you, if you take a step back and you think about farming, um, your input is corn and soy, which are commodities that are yeah. bought and sold and traded. And there's like, you know, it has to do with weather. It has to do with demand. It has to do with what China's doing at any given point. Like, 
and, and then you have at the end of the day you have a fluctuating market for for pork prices that they don't know you don't know what that's going to be like yeah what do you do you just keep raising pigs you just yeah. like keep going yeah. just keep trying um and so we've heard story after story of of people who uh have like either lost everything or are just taking a loss year after year and and you know supplementing by getting a job somewhere else like the the pig farming thing doesn't work now i should say that um none of that exists in in the world that we we exist in so um one of the things for butcher box that we've we've gotten really excited about and have really moved forward in a big way like we we got into this because i was convinced that eating this type of meat was healthier for me and for my wife and for my growing family um, and then as, as we've gotten into it, we've, we've realized like, what about better for the environment? The environmental outcomes are really interesting when you put an animal on the land, what it can do, that's exciting. And, you know, then there's the farmer. And, um, for a lot of these farmers, one of the benefits of using your dollars to purchase meat that is, uh, either butcher box or a claims based meat, um, the farmer tends to be like their pricing is not the market commodity price. Yeah. So whereas the floor fell out on conventional beef during, we just kept paying the farmer the same price. So they did fantastically throughout that entire that entire time. Same with pork. Same with chicken. I mean, they basically avoided the catastrophe that was happening to their neighbor's farm yeah. because they chose to raise the animal differently. Um, and to me, that feels like this is the moment for claims based meat to like really. Um, Part of the challenge with claims base is convincing the farmer to raise an animal differently because they've been raising it a certain way for generation after generation after generation. And it's like, how do you convince them like to do something different? And this moment in particular is, is we're, we're very excited about the fact that on the supply side, on the farmer side, there's way more interest than ever to raise animals differently because people just don't want to deal with the market fluctuations of like what's happened. Yeah, totally. And it, 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 do you think that, I mean, because one of the questions that popped to mind was, um, and you may not uh, be privy to all the details, but I mean, are the, are the banks giving a lot of these farmers any leniency considering what's going on on these, you know, these paying back these loans to acquire cattle initially when everything hit or they just, are the banks just kind of saying <laughs> you're on your own? Um, that leads me to the next question is, do you, in your opinion, see banks possibly lending themselves to be a little bit more favorable towards companies that are being uh, ethically sourcing and ethically raising, you know, animals. Yeah. Um, so uh, on the first question, I don't really know. I know that a lot of people have had huge financial losses and part of the second um, bill uh, had about $26 billion that was earmarked towards helping farmers um, to, uh, did we freeze there? Uh, no, you just... I think we're good. Okay, cool. Um, Am I still frozen or did I, did I... Uh, you were frozen, but that's fine. Okay. We're, we're good. Um, so uh, I know that um, uh, about $26 billion in the, the latest relief package was to go directly to farmers who had uh, suffered losses. Um, so that's good because there's a lot of losses out there. And I think I think the government is trying to do whatever they can to kind of shoulder the burden of what happened during. I'm not sure. Um, I imagine that banks have been pretty lenient because, you know, these community banks, I mean, what are you going to do? Everyone in your community is in the same boat. So it's like, I don't, I, I don't know how you handle it any other way. Um, and we, we have not seen, we have not seen a bank step up. We have not seen the government step up in a way that really honors what um, claims base could do. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's kind of become my work and our work is like, how do we convince, um, uh, so uh, how do you convince the government? How do you convince banks? How do you convince farmers? How do you convince people to like make this a thing yeah. uh, rather than it's just like some small niche market? I mean, yeah. when I go, I go to like the meat conference every year, there's, there's a meat conference and we're what we're doing is considered like uh, a total niche, like throwaway, not that interesting uh, type of thing because conventional meat you know, meat raised with antibiotics and hormones in a feedlot, conventionally raised, is by far the market leader. And so people aren't really giving claims based. It's um, what, what I think is, you know, what, how it should be, how it should be looked at. Um, and uh, and I think I think we need more kind of intervention to help help move things along. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's 
it's refreshing to see. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this with I, I don't believe it's it's really the quote all natural burger, but it's nice to see things that like Carl's Jr. coming out with at least in their marketing, they're pushing that right a little bit you know cleaner. And the reason, even though again, I'm not gonna speak out of term because I haven't investigated it thoroughly, but the point is is that clearly there's demand and you've got a health conscious millennial boom, right? That's, yep. they're going to be paying attention to that. And I think this is again, my opinion, but you see a lot of these, you know, the, the farmers are probably just being driven by what's been working for the last 20, 30 years. Right. right. And it's, it, it's just like anything. I mean, there's a new era of business coming through and it's going to take a lot of time to see that. And then considering how slow the supply chain ultimately is to your point, that just adds that extra length of time to transition into any kind of new consumer or yeah. consumer mentality. Yeah. So it's like meat is going to move at a slower pace than say processed health foods. Like it's just, it's going to move slower. So, yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting to us. So, I, I mean, the, the backstory of meat is basically since the 1950s, uh, the, the country as a whole has followed one, one, and I know you've talked about this in some of your videos, like uh, the country, the only thing they cared about was making meat as cheap as possible. Yeah. That was it. To the detriment of the animal itself, putting them in horrific conditions, to the detriment of the environment, to the detriment of the farmer, to the detriment of the end consumer. The only thing that mattered was we're going to get you food at the lowest price possible. We're going to get you a gram of protein for as cheap as possible. And to, today, that still remains the, the mentality of the big players. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's like, yeah, claim space, that, that's great, but how are you going to feed people? And it's like, well, we could try to figure out how to scale a real, like, program where we treat people with integrity, you know, like, treat <laughs> chain with integrity. That is possible. Like, that, that's one solution. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that the... Um, I, I think people people do need to wake up to the kind of the demand is coming. And it's like what 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 concerns me the most is I was talking about before the greenwashing of the meat case where where the 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 meat they'll have all these labels with all this green stuff on it. They haven't really changed the way that they're raising the animal. In many cases, they've just changed the way that the label looks, right? Yeah. To meet the demand. And I think that the millennial consumer and those coming up behind the millennial consumer are smart enough and active enough to actually want to dig in deep, to do their yeah. research, to understand what's happening. And, um, you know, I think that's good news for ButcherBox, but it does mean, we, you know, we, we're of the mindset that um, we think that the whole industry can change. Like, we're not trying to control the market. We're trying to move the market. And, yeah. you know, we, and so I, I think there's a lot of work to be done in order to really, uh, that we can live in a world where we're we're excited about the the meat we're offering and also um that the industry has moved in a measurable direction but i totally agree it's going to take forever it's, it's going to yeah it's going to take time and it's going to take you know people like yourself and people like myself that are, are spreading this message any, anyway right it's and you think about it you walk into a grocery store and you see this greenwashed meat from the perspective of someone that isn't necessarily a millennial or isn't, uh, what is it, you know, the generation behind millennials, it's, it would make sense that that is where the education would occur. They're at the grocery store because they're of the mindset that someone is not educated prior to going to the grocery store. And they yeah. probably live in a world where the education is occurring at the grocery store. I think most of even my generation walks into a grocery store already 50% educated. Like we're already there. Okay. Yeah. We, we're just looking for something to push us over the edge. And that's exactly what I try to preach on my channel is like, know the buzzwords, know the words that really should be on the packaging. And if you know the economics and you know the legal side of any kind of food industry, then you can have x-ray vision to look at a package and know what is BS and what's not. Right. Um, and that's you know exactly what, what you're doing. What I'm doing is Education. We're not trying to, to bash anybody. We're not. All we can do is light up people with education, and they can make their own decision. And yes, it might take some time, but you know, the nice thing is, hopefully, my kids are going to live in a world where, you know, when they're my age, they're able to shop at a grocery store and be able to get the kind of quality meat that you would get from Butcher Box right now. You know, right. it's right. that's a, that's what I can only hope. And, yeah, exactly. uh, you know, I have three young kids as well, and I mean, that's my hope as well that they. Uh, we can reconnect consumers with the meat that they're eating in a way that's like brand new 
or not brand new. It's just going back, right? Yeah. Like way back to, yeah. to a different time. Um, and yeah, um, so the, the stat is the average, uh, the average person spends 13 seconds in front of the meat case. That's it. Wow. So there's actually not enough time to do any education. No, there's no education. It's or, or like well, it's 13 seconds. You know, they're basically, they, they're creatures of habit, just like you. So they're choosing the same thing for the most part, or they're buying on special, whatever is on special. And that's like pretty much it. And then they're gone. Um, and so uh, I think that's where online is really interesting because people are more willing to watch a video. They're willing to read an article. They're willing to listen to somebody talk about the benefits in a way that um, I, I think online is really where m the meat revolution will happen um, because there's just not enough time for somebody who's shopping in the grocery store. And those numbers have actually only gone down with, uh, with now that people are shopping during, uh, a, they're um, shopping with like a utilitarian, like I need chicken breast and I'm getting out. Like, I don't yeah. want to learn about anything. I, I don't want to touch anything. I don't want to learn about anything. I just want to get in and get out. Yep. Um, and so that, you know, the, the education piece is obviously, hopefully this goes away at some point, but the education piece has um, only gotten harder to do at the, at, at the retail store. Totally. Well, and then just to piggyback on that. And one thing that I was, I, I wrote this down as a question I specifically wanted to ask you, but what, what particular meat, you know, chicken, turkey, fish, you know, pork, whatever, beef, which one is the most difficult to obtain in like an ethical, healthy way? Like really, like which one, I think we automatically just think beef and maybe it is beef, but it, it, which one is the most difficult to really get in a true clean fashion? So, um, oof, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. It depends on what you consider to be ethical and <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, on the pork side, uh, it's really hard to find organic pork or to find pork that is um, like fully non-GMO. Um, noticed that, yeah, definitely noticed mainly that. Mainly because uh, most where most of the pork is raised is in the Midwest, uh, and generally, what you're doing is you're convincing corn farmers to raise pigs, and so they can you can never like. If, if you're pasture raising a pig, you can't say it hasn't eaten GMOs because the corn, literally yeah. the corn on their land is with GMOs. So yeah. that's like, you know, so then it's like, we, we always talk about this of the trade-offs, like what do you care about the most and what, like what, what things matter the most? Um, I would say for at least what we're currently working with and has been the hardest is uh, a true pasture raised program like animal or cow living on grass all the time in the United States um, is very hard to do. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of reasons for that. One is that this entire industry has been built to feed the feedlots. And so that's just how people have done things and how the loans work and how, you know, like the whole system works to, to feed the feedlot. Um, it's also land. It takes a lot of land to raise an animal and land is expensive. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of caught in this world where uh, we want to, the ideal scenario for us would be to have a 100% domestic grass-fed beef program. Uh, we do supplement our, uh, a, a lot of our beef from Australia mm -hmm. because Australia and, and New Zealand, Australia and New Zealand are like what you picture in your mind of grass-fed. Like literally yeah. it's like, all right, let's hop in the Jeep and find the cows. We don't know where they are. And like, literally they're driving around trying to find the cows. Um, it's, you know, most programs in the United States are unfortunately trying to figure out how to do confined grass fed feeding, Yeah, which means you put them in a feedlot next to a uh, corn fed animal and you feed it corn stalks because corn stalks are technically considered grass um, and, you know, and a pellet and you're calling it grass fed. And I don't believe that that's what the customer is looking for. No, I agree. So one of the things, you know, one of the things that bothers me is like, I want to support the American farmer throughout our entire system. And it's like the hardest has been, how do you bring those dollars home? Uh, yeah. When, you, when it's it just like, literally we have to build it and it's going to yeah. take a long time to do. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, I, I, for one have just the utmost appreciation for what you guys are doing. And the reason that I was so game to do this video on my channel is because I, 
it's important that people really know that like butcher box isn't just you're not just packaging up meat and sending it in the mail you know that's not how this works this is a paradigm shift for meat as a whole and it's you know people people are mean and nasty on youtube no matter what but you know for the most part there's 99 percent of people that watch my channel are appreciative of any sponsor that's on my channel or, and they usually understand that I, I choose to work with brands that align with my values and align with my moral compass, uh, which is pretty direct. I have a pretty narrow scope with my moral compass. So the scope of which brands that I can work with is pretty narrow. Uh, and it's just, it's not, you're not just packaging up meat. It's, there's a lot that goes into this, which is why explaining what it takes to raise an animal, to put it through this whole process. It's not like we're just packaging up corn chips here it's uh, you know, and then in the states to, to your point too it's like um i can speak from a health perspective you have a small amount of land and you're trying to raise animals even if you're doing it properly you can only get so many nutrients out of one acre no matter how much you irrigate it and try to regrow you know eventually soil becomes depleted because we see this in all kinds of different agricultural settings you know, we see depletion in magnesium and phosphorus and everything like that in our, in our soil, which is why a lot of us have mineral deficiencies. Well, eventually, you know, do the math that kind of ends up down the food chain, literally. So, um, well, one of the things that, you know, I wanted to ask too is like, where outside of sort of the ethical moral piece and, and changing the world with this, I mean, where do you see ButcherBox going? Like, what is your sort of your, your five-year trajectory um, from a business perspective? Because I'm Still as an entrepreneur to entrepreneur, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, um, you know, uh, I started this company. Um, I had been running a venture backed uh, business for about six years with my best friend. Uh, it's called custommade.com, and we connected uh, customers with artisans who made things custom. And um, it flamed out in what I would consider spectacular fashion. We hit a wall. <laughs> had to let everyone go. My co-founder still runs it with like four of the original people, but you know, we had to fire like 50 people. It was, it was awful. Um, and, uh, and then I was supposed to take a bunch of time off and I ended up taking the weekend off and then starting butcher. Box. <laughs> it was supposed to be a hobby. It wasn't supposed to be like a big business. It was supposed to be a hobby, but I, um, a few things that had always driven me. Uh, one, I always had this feeling or this itch that I was going to do something big or run a big company or like do, you know, like create something cool in the world. Um, and two, I always had this like revolutionary bent to me. Like I wanted to change the world. But I realized at a pretty young age that I wasn't going to be able to change the world by like going to a protest and protesting. Yeah. That that was not going to be my way of changing the world. That really I wanted to change the world from the inside. I wanted to change industries from the inside. Um, and so with meat, like that is essentially that was the approach is like get in, start with a Kickstarter. People really liked it and then it grew and grew and then it just, you know, kind of really grew. And um, and now we've picked up our head. We're about to celebrate our five year uh, uh, birthday. And it's just like, wow, you know, when I started, it was really about building a great hobby. So building a good income stream. And then it was like, wow, maybe we can prove that you don't have to raise venture capital to start a company like you. You can do things differently. You can do yeah. things on your own terms. And I'm like a big believer. I think entrepreneurship has been hijacked by like the idea that uh, two things breaking entrepreneurship right now. One, the idea that you have to raise money mm -hmm. and two, this, um, you know, part of my French is bullshit, like belief that in hustle culture that you have to be 24 seven or at, yes. like at, to the detriment of your health, to the detriment of your family, to the detriment of your soul in order to succeed. And neither of those are true. Like, let me just, you know, be yeah, thank you for saying that. <laughs> like it, that is not true. Um, entrepreneurship is about allowing like your heart and, uh, you know, creating something that comes from your values and you, like you as an individual. And um, so I, I think, you know, go, let's call it year one through year four and a half. We're really like fighting against that, that story. Yeah. And now we're like, okay, we fought against that story. We've been able to establish a company. And now what? Like, and, and I'm a big believer that companies um, and brands like take on a life of their own. And what I've always said about ButcherBox is like, again, I tried to start this as a hobby. ButcherBox did not want to be a hobby. 
Yeah. Uh, and then I tried to start this as like, oh, I'll just prove people wrong. And ButcherBox was like, no, we're going to we're going to keep going. And so now what is ButcherBox saying? ButcherBox is saying that, like, we actually have the opportunity to change the industry. It, we have the opportunity to change the meat industry in this country in a meaningful, measurable way. Uh, and that is so cool. I mean, it's so cool to be in that seat, to be like, yeah. oh, great, like, let's go. Let's try to do this. And. You know, so we have this um, this belief. It's on my it's on my uh, wristband. It's called Believe in Better, and it's this this idea that we can build a company that's better for the animal, that better for the environment, better for the end consumer, better for the farmer. And if we keep all those things in check, this pie of like, let's keep all of those in check, that we can um, you know make moves that help all of those different areas at the same time, or like you know move up one without hurting a different one. And so our five-year plan, I mean, first of all, I've, um, I'm not going anywhere. I love what I do. Um, I've now kind of realized this might be my life's work. Like I might just be really uniquely suited to, you know, figure out grass-fed beef in the United States. Uh, I happen to be Uruguayan. Uruguay is a big grass-fed beef place. So, and maybe this is like in my blood that this was my, this was my lot in life. And I'm super excited about that. Um, but I think that uh, if we get to do what I would like to do over the next five years, um, I think that we have a lot of work to do in um, one, bring, bringing grass-fed beef domestically, two, making it more accessible. Like whether we like it or not, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, the price point for claims-based meat makes it unaccessible for a lot of people. I think we can change that. And I don't think we have to sacrifice on claims or animal quality or any of that. Um, and I, 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 what we do is we listen to our customer and then deliver. So we've, you know, we just, we just started lobster. We have cod. We've, we, we're moving into all these. We're about to do pre-cooked stuff. Like we're moving into all these areas that people have asked for. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Americans eat a lot of meat. Um, we're certainly not feeding them all the meat that they want. And what we hear from customers is, It'd be really great if you could help handle, you know, solve breakfast for me. It'd be really great to solve snacks for me. I'm sending my kid to school and I don't know what to put in their lunchbox. And so I think, um, you know, we're, we're in a place where we're trying to listen to that input and then decide, like, how do we how do we respond? Um, but but yeah, I mean, and, and again, uh, claims based or grass fed beef, grass fed beef is two percent of the overall market in the United States for beef. It's tiny. Yeah. So we're not like we want to be the only player in grass fed beef. We would be thrilled to help anyone competing, like, because we believe we're not, we're not trying to keep other people out of the 2%. We're yeah. trying to move the 2% to 10% yeah. uh, and like, and bring people along with us to do that. Exactly. No, that's, uh, that's spot on. And I think that that's that 10%, you know, may not uh, grow to 20% in our lifetime, but, Maybe it'll grow to 20 percent in the next, you know, the next generation, 30 percent. And eventually it's just the way it's done. And I love the way that you said it. I mean, it, there there has got to be a way to scale with integrity. Like it, there just there is yep. you can't you can't just doesn't need to be this cutthroat. Just make everything work and give everyone garbage mentality. Yep. There is. Yeah, it might take a little bit more on the front end in terms of ingenuity and making it work and getting creative. But, you know, this country wasn't built on a lack of creativity. So let's let's make it happen <laughs> yeah well in, in the last thing that i really wanted to kind of end on i mean i know butcher box gives back to the world a lot and i just wanted to kind of give you a chance to to describe uh you know some of the things that butcher box is doing to, to just to give back yeah yeah totally um so we uh this year decided hey if we're going to be um successful and we're going to be growing um and we're going to be thinking about the world in terms of uh, the believe in better and uh, the believe in better pie and, and, you know, the environment, et cetera, animals, farmer. Um, how do we be global stewards and like, and, and help? Um, and some of the causes that we give to, uh, they basically fit into that. What can we do for the animal? Okay. So can we, can we give to, to causes that um, care about compassion for animals or humane treatment of animals or, you know, what can we do for animals? What can we do for farmers? Farmers are hurting right now. Suicide rates are super high. Uh, there's a lot of debt. There's lack of education. So what can we do for farmers? Environment. Can we help fund um, people who are doing research on how to keep pa pasture uh, programs going, how to keep uh, soil regenerating? Um, you know, uh, 
actually trying to measure the impact of a grass-fed animal versus a grain-fed animal. I mean, there's some really interesting research there. The other cause that we're pretty interested in is um, uh, Pebble Mine, um, which is a mine project in Alaska that is threatening Bristol Bay, which is where we get our sockeye salmon from. Uh, so we're trying to help in any way we can to, um, uh, the mine has not, they've not started mining. It's in ver various stages of approval, but we're trying to, um, trying to put an end to that or stop that. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's a fairly broad mix. And the, the cool thing is like, I've basically just set the direction, you know, it's like, Hey, we're just going to give money. Um, and then there's teams of people who are figuring out like, what do we care about? What are we giving yeah. to? And that changes. I mean, it's been interesting to, to see kind of where the needs are and just try to insert ourselves. We also are very active with donating to food banks. Um, so if we run a promotion, for example, for Thanksgiving turkeys, and it's like, oh, we were off and we have some turkeys left over. Um, we have partnerships at all the food banks uh, or we have distribution centers and then we have partnerships with food banks that will just come and pick up our food and get it into the in, into the community. Um, and so, yeah, we're uh, I, I, I'm a very much a believer of leading with heart and compassion. And I think um, our giving our giving approach has has certainly lined up with with that. Uh, and I, and I think we can do more. I mean, you know, the, the part with all this stuff is, is ne you're never even scratching the surface of what you could do. So it's, yeah. um, as we go forward, it's just going to be a bigger and bigger and more important thing for us. Totally agree, man. Well, it's, it's an honor to be partnered with you and all these you know, reasons that you've been talking about is exactly why, why we're aligned. So I think we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up because I know that the viewers are probably ready to go ahead and absorb some more keto and fasting knowledge and <laughs> get on through playlists. But man, it was super awesome to have you on here. And I, I hope that everyone down below in the comment section can just you know give a big thank you to Mike and to the Butcher Box team just for for doing what they do to the world, doing what they do to our country, doing what they do for for this channel and for the people that watch this channel and and for my team as well. So Mike, from uh, on behalf of all of my YouTube channel and everyone that watches, thank you guys very, very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right.